We've been in a series over the last seven weeks. I know some of you are beginning to think to yourself, is this series ever going to end? And um, next Sunday, uh, we will be ending this series. Uh, Today, I want to talk to you about something that I think is very, very important for us who are followers of Jesus. In this series, we've learned a lot of things together, some things that are very important for each and every one of us. And we've said from the very beginning that to follow Jesus involves three things. And every week I've kind of come back to those and talked about those. And uh, the last couple of weeks we're really going to kind of hone in on some things. But today, as we begin, I want to just go back just for a moment and say, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And we believe that there are three things that are defined that it means to follow Jesus. If you want to write it in your notes, you can. But I just want to go back and revisit this just for a second. First of all, it's to be with Jesus. That is that every day you have a time that you spend with Jesus, that you talk to him in prayer, that you read the Bible, that you spend a little bit of time of solitude, uh, allowing him to be able to speak into your life. And then secondly, it's to become like Jesus, to become like Jesus. And we believe that means that in our heart and in our character, we begin to change and to become more like Jesus. And then thirdly, it's to do as Jesus did. And I told you in the very, very beginning that oftentimes what happens is we want to be with Jesus and to do as Jesus did, but the reality is we have to become like Jesus. And last week, Roy talked about wanting what Jesus wants, not what we want, but what he wants, and making sure that in our hearts and in our lives that we are becoming more and more like him. And so from the very beginning, we've learned some very unique things about following Jesus. If you go back and you kind of think about the first message, we talked about the idea that everybody's invited to follow Jesus. The invitation is open to every single one of us, and the invitation is an invitation to a relationship. It's not an invitation to religious beliefs. It's not an invitation necessarily uh, to rules and regulations, but it's a relationship with our Heavenly Father who created us through His Son, Jesus Christ. We also said uh, that um, uh, for for those who begin to follow Jesus, there were some prerequisites, if you remember. Uh, We said part of the prerequisite is is that you have to be a sinner. Uh, Probably you've had some doubts along the way. But as we begin to look at this whole concept and idea of following Jesus, we discovered that in following Jesus, there are always next steps. Next steps that we're to take, ways that we can continue to grow in our relationship with Christ. And then we talked about the idea of how following Jesus uh, or Jesus followers dress a certain way. Uh, The Bible tells us that we're to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness and love. And we talked about the importance of putting those things on. That when people look at us and they see our lives, that those are the things that should mark our lives that make us different uh, than the world around us. And then we said that following Jesus would eventually cost us something. And we looked at the disciples and what it cost them and the importance of us understanding the cost that is involved for each and every one of us to follow Jesus. And then we looked at the results that when you follow Jesus, the reward is an unshakable life and how every single one of us long to have that unshakable life. And then last week, Roy talked about following Jesus will change what you want. Today, I want to talk about this idea of following Jesus and how when you and I choose to follow Jesus, we begin to lead great in our lives. I believe that the greatest leaders in the world should be followers of Jesus. I believe that in every organization, that every person uh, who maybe is not a follower of Christ, who may say, hey, I really don't want to follow Jesus, but I'll tell you this, I want to work for somebody who knows Jesus. Because when I uh, know someone and when I've worked with someone who knows Jesus, they lead at a completely different level. They are a totally different person. I love leadership. In fact, years ago, I remember the first leadership conference I ever attended in my life. It was a leadership conference in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was in 1995. I had just started in ministry or early in ministry. And I remember driving to North Carolina and spending three days with John Maxwell and a group of other pastors from around the country. And what we did was talk about leadership. 
and the importance of leadership, not only in the church, but the importance of equipping and training people in the church to be great leaders in their workplaces and in the community and to make a difference through the way that we led. So the question I want to begin with today is a question that I want you to ask yourself. And I know that some of you may have a tendency when I ask this question to immediately say to yourself, well, that's not me, but I want you to think a little bit deeper, all right? So I want to ask you this question, who are you leading? I want you to think about that just for a second. Who are you leading? Now, you may think to yourself, well, I'm an at-home mom, so I'm really not leading anybody. Yes, you are. You're leading your children. You do have influence. Every single one of us have influence. You may think, well, I'm a grandparent, but let me tell you this. You're leading your grandchildren as a grandparent. Every one of us is leading someone. You may be leading your spouse. You may be leading your family. You may be leading at work. You may be uh, a boss at work. I don't know. But all of us in some way are leading someone else. And when you think about leadership, I want to ask you another question. What do you think Jesus teaches about leadership? Do you think the way Jesus led and many of the books that we read today are different? Are there different styles? Are there different ways that people lead? Specifically, when you think about Jesus, did Jesus lead in a different way than most leaders lead today? And if Jesus did, then what is it about Jesus that made him such a great leader? Because I want you to think about this. Over 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him. We're still looking at his life. We're still examining who he is. We know that Jesus' brand is still uh, throughout every community all over the world today, right? If you want to talk about marketing, uh, he was a genius at it in the way that he did it. And as a leader, how did he make that kind of impact? And what was it about his leadership that was so different? Today, we're going to look at a particular story in the Bible in Mark chapter 10. And we're going to pick up, as we've been looking through the gospel of Mark over the past few weeks together, we're going to pick up with a story today. And I want you to listen because Jesus really confronts this idea of leadership with those who are following him. And he really talks about, and really, he says this to them. He says, this is not to be so with you. You are to lead in a different way. And I think it's something important for us as we come towards the end of this series to go back and to really begin to ask ourselves the same question. And that is the question of what is the leadership of a follower of Jesus really to be like? And how are we to lead not only inside of organizations, but also with our family and our kids and our grandkids and our spouse and in the different places that God has entrusted us with influence and leadership in our lives? And so I want you to turn to John chapter 10. We're going to begin in verse 32. It's there in your notes. It'll be on the screen. And we're going to kind of walk through it. And I want to try to help you to understand a little bit of what Jesus is going through, him and his disciples, and what's taking place. And then specifically what he's trying to teach us. Beginning in verse 32, it says this. They, that is, the disciples, or or the apostles, and Jesus, and all of those who were following him, were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus, leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Now, the reason they were afraid is something that had happened earlier. Basically, there was a little bit of fear because Jesus had been talking to them about what's about to happen to him. He had been telling the crowd, hey, there's a cost involved in following me. And he specifically had just talked to them about the kingdom of God and what it was like to be able to enter into the kingdom of God. And so there was a fear that some of them had. But notice what it says. It says again. That means that he had done this before. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen. That is, Jesus is explaining to them one more time, all right, guys, as you're following me, I want you to know what's about to happen. Things are about to get real. There's a problem that we're about to face. I'm going to go up, and what's going to happen is uh, uh, there's uh, something that's going to happen to me, and if it happens to me, you better believe that there's probably going to be something that happens to you. And so what was beginning to happen is Jesus was trying to help them to understand. If you were here a few weeks ago, uh, he was trying to help them to understand uh, the price that was about to be paid. The cost that he was fixing to pay uh, for not only accomplishing God's will, but doing what God had called him to do. 
Now, if you're online, I want you to just type that word again in the, uh, in the chat just for a second. Because this is another time that Jesus pauses. He looks at his disciples and he says, guys, let me explain to you what's about to happen. The notice in verse 33. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He basically is saying to them, all right, guys, you know that up till now, uh, every time that I teach, when the Pharisees and religious leaders come and those Roman soldiers, oftentimes the crowds have pushed them away. But it's not going to be like that this time. Something different is going to happen this time. In fact, they protected me up to this point. But at this point, something is about to change. Notice what he says. They will condemn him, talking about himself in third person. Uh, he says, to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, that is, to the Romans, who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now, it's important to understand that this is a tender moment for Jesus and his disciples. Jesus has pulled them over to the side. He's talking to them. He's sharing his heart with them. He's saying, hey, guys, here's what's going to happen. We're going to get up to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to beat me. They're going to kill me. But let me just tell you something. Three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And so this would be one of those moments that maybe you've had with your kids where, where you're talking and you're sharing your heart and there's this tender exchange that is happening. And that's exactly in this moment what's happening with Jesus and the disciples. But then notice what happens. It says this. It says, then, that is, immediately after Jesus had had this tender moment, had spoke these words, had explained what was going to happen, it says, then the very next thing that happened is James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, I want you to think about that. Really? Like Jesus just had this tender moment with you. He's sharing his heart. He tells you that he is going to get mocked and spit on and flogged and killed. And I mean, basically, they say, hey, Jesus, by the way, uh, man, we're sorry about the flogging and the, uh, the, the, the mocking and the spitting and the killing and all of that stuff. But Jesus, will you do us a favor? Now, if you're a parent, you know this. This has probably happened in your life. Right? You've got this tender moment with your kids where you're sharing your heart. And all of a sudden, like, like maybe you're getting ready to put them in the bed and you're talking and you're like, hey, guys, like, let me just tell you about this. And, and as you're having this conversation, there's this tender moment. And all of a sudden, as a parent, you get to the end and you say, hey, kids, you know, after this serious moment, you say something like this. Are there any questions? And one of your kids says, yeah, can I go out and play? Or, or can, I have, can I have dinner? Or dad, have you ever noticed that when you talk, like there's a little thing on your tooth that like is sticking down and you're thinking to yourself, what in the world is happening? Like we just had this tender moment together. Well, that's exactly what happened between Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus is thinking to himself, guys, are you kidding me? And then it says, and then all of a sudden they say, will you do for us what we ask you to do? So notice what Jesus does in verse 36. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in glory. Now, what they were thinking to themselves, because remember, uh, uh, they're thinking that Jesus is going to set up a kingdom, right? And that he's going to exchange uh, his, uh, um, I'm sorry, his rabbinical robe uh, for the robe of a king. And so they're thinking to themselves, hey, when you become king, uh, when, you, when you begin to rule, will you let one of us sit on your right hand and one of us sit on your, uh, your left hand? Basically, what they were saying is, Jesus, can one of us be the vice president and one of us the CFO? Like, that, that's what we want. We, we want to make sure that we know that, like, like, you're the king, but we want to be able to rule over people also. And we want to be able to lead at a higher level also in our lives. And so that's what they're asking of Jesus. And in verse 41, listen to what it says. It says, when the, the ten heard about this, talking about the other apostles or disciples, it says, they became indignant with James and John. Now, this is important. They weren't indignant with James and John because they had kind of disrespected Jesus. 
uh, they had kind of like, you know, said, hey, in this tender moment, just sort of blown past it. They were indignant because they were jealous that they had asked first. They're like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Uh, If you get to ask this, we want to be able to ask this also. Like, what about us, Jesus? And then in verse 42, listen to what it says. It says, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Now, there are two Greek words that Jesus uses here. In fact, these Greek words actually do not appear anywhere else in Scripture. And here's what Jesus was trying to get them to see. I'm going to show you this. It's on a slide. And I want you to look at this with me because Jesus is trying to get them to see that basically he says, all right, this is you, like you're the leader. And then, you know, you've got your direct reports. There's three people that report to you and they're for you also. And then their reports actually report to them, but they are for you also. And then they have reports and those reports are for you. That's the way it worked in the Roman world. That's how they would lead. Everything was about others serving you. They were there for you. They were there for the organization. They were there for the business. And Jesus said, this is how you think of leadership. And this is the way you think that you're supposed to lead. And this is how the world around you teaches you to lead. And some of you that are leading organizations, you know this. With your direct reports and the reports that report to them, oftentimes, if you're not careful, you can think they are here for you. They are here to serve you. They are here to help you. They are here to make you look good. They are here to make sure that whatever you want gets accomplished. But Jesus says something very important. As he's talking to his disciples, he's saying, the way that you lead your family and how you lead your kids and the way that you are going to lead when you are put in a position of authority and when you are entrusted with leadership and when you are entrusted with authority, the way you lead is to be different. It's not to be like the Gentiles. It's not to be like the Romans. The way that you lead is to be like me. You are to look at me and to look at the way that I've led and to look at me and to look at the way that I have impacted those that are around them. And so here's what he says. Notice in verse 43, he says, not so with you, talking to the disciples, not so with you if you're a follower of Jesus. He said, this is not the way that you're supposed to lead. You're supposed to lead differently. Notice how he he says it uh, in verse uh, 43. He says, instead... Whoever wants to become great among you, and great just simply means to rule or to lead or to have authority, because that's what they were asking for. They were saying, can we lead? Can we have authority? Can we be great uh, among others, Jesus? And Jesus said, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your what? Let's say it out loud together. What does it say? Servant. Servant. He says, Whoever wants to be great must be your servant. Now, if you're online, just type the word servant in online just for a moment. The word servant, all right? Now, and he says in verse 44, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, you may be sitting there today and thinking to yourself, but wait a second. I thought the whole point of being in charge was to be in charge. Like, I thought that's what Jesus was calling me to do. I didn't know that he was calling me to be a servant. I didn't know that he was calling me to be a slave. I mean, isn't it true that as a leader, people are here to serve me? And let me tell you something. If that's the way that you lead, you're a bad leader. Because that is not the way that Jesus led, and it is not the way that Jesus has called each and every one of us to lead. Now, listen to me very carefully, because for some of you that are in organizational leadership, you're thinking to yourself, well, Pastor Marty, are you really going to tell me that what you're fixing to say is that Jesus' way of of leading is actually the best way to lead? And I'm going to tell you, absolutely. In fact, I'm going to show you somebody who wrote a book called Good to Great, Jim Collins, that actually set out to discover the greatest trait of leadership. And what he discovered actually shell-shocked him that he found that every great leader of most great organizations, almost every single one of them led with humility. They were different than other leaders. He thought it was going to be charisma. He thought that they would lead uh, with, with some of these great principles. But the reality was what he found is that most of them were very humble and they were for the people that they were leading. And they led almost exactly opposite of what that chart just showed us. 
You see, his point is not that there shouldn't be leaders or positions of authority or that uh, everyone should be equal. That's not at all what Jesus was saying because Jesus didn't operate that way. Think about it. I mean, he was the one that led the disciples. He was training them and equipping them. And then he sent them out two by two. He didn't lead that way. But then secondly, notice this, nor is that leader or is it that leaders shouldn't get anything done and just walk around with a towel over their arm and serve everybody else. They're never making decisions. They're always serving others. That is not what Jesus was saying. That wasn't the way that Jesus led either. If you remember, there were moments when Jesus would pause and he would take a towel and he'd put it over his arm and he would serve those around him. There were times that, that he was a servant to those that were with him, that he would serve them. And if you go back and look at history, history tells us that Jesus elevated women to a level that they had never been elevated before. Jesus cared for the down and out. He wanted justice for those that had experienced injustice. And so Jesus led in a completely different way. In fact, here's the bottom line today. This is the one thought that I want to try to help you to understand. We are to leverage our authority for the benefit of those under our authority. That's what Jesus did. We are to leverage our authority for the benefit of those who are under our authority. Mom and dad, you are to leverage your authority for the benefit of your kids. Uh, husbands, you are to leverage your authority for the benefit of your spouse and for the benefit of your children. Grandparents, you are to level or you are to leverage the authority that you have been entrusted with in order that you can what? You can leverage it for those that are under your authority, your grandchildren. If you're a boss and you're here today, you are to leverage your authority for the benefit of those who are under your authority. And everything that you do, you may be thinking to yourself, Pastor Marty, what does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. It means you're to leverage your power for those that are under your authority. You're to leverage your decision-making for those that are under your authority. You're to leverage your persuasion. You're, you're, you're to leverage your experience. You're to leverage the opportunities that are presented to you for those who are under your authority. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was constantly asking himself the question, what is this going to do for others? How is this going to impact those that are under my leadership? What is it going to do for the people that have been entrusted to my authority? How am I to lead them and what am I supposed to do for them? So we leverage our power, our decision making, our experience, our persuasion, our opportunities, all for those who are under our authority. And you may be thinking to yourself, does this kind of leading really work? You're absolutely right that it does. You may be thinking to yourself, well, it sounds good inside of the church, but Marty, in the real world, this really doesn't work. Yes, it does. And I believe that those of us who are followers of Jesus are responsible because Jesus, just like he said to the disciples, is calling you and me to do the exact same thing in our life. He's saying, I want you to be responsible for taking this teaching and living it out in the everyday world around you. I want you to live it out in the schoolhouse as a teacher, as you leverage your authority for those that are under your authority, the kids that you are teaching. I want you to live it out in your homes as mom and dads, as you leverage your authority for the authority of your kids as they're uh, under your authority inside of your home. I want you as a coach, when you have authority and power, to leverage your authority for the authority of those kids or for the benefit of those kids that are under your authority. Use your power in such a way that it benefits them, that you make a difference in their life, that you equip and train them and speak into them and help them so that their life is going to be better. In our community, as leaders, as business leaders, as politicians, as individuals that lead in different places, you are to leverage your authority uh, for those that are under your authority in such a way. Now, if you believe that, um, and, and here's why I believe this. Let me, let me just explain this. I think this will help, help make sense to you. If I'm the kind of boss that at work, or if you're the kind of boss at work that you believe that the, the way that you create the most productive place that you can is to always look out for yourself, I want to ask you this question. If you believe that I am for me, what are you going to do? You had better be on the lookout for you. Think about what that does in a work environment. If you believe the boss is all about himself 
and that all he's ever going to do is look out for himself, then what you're going to do is you're going to begin to be on the lookout for you. You're like, you know what? He don't care about me. She don't care about me. They don't care about me. I'm going to look out for my best interest because guess what? Nobody else cares about me. But listen to this. If you believe I'm for you, If my employees believe that I care about them, if they believe that in every decision I make, that in everything that I do, that in every every opportunity that is presented, I am thinking about my authority and how it affects those that are under my authority, and I want it to be for the benefit of not only the organization, but a benefit for every single one of them, what do you think is going to happen to them? Now, they can be for the people that report to them, because guess what? I know he's got my back. I know she's going to protect me. I know they're always looking out for me. I know that they care about me. Therefore, I can care for the people that are under my authority because I know my back is protected and I know the person up there cares about me and they're going to do what's in the best interest of not just themselves, but they're going to do what's in the best interest of everyone that's involved. And guess what? You don't have to waste your time looking over your shoulder or guarding your turf because that's exactly what happened with the disciples. Remember? They saw James and John talking to Jesus, and they said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. They've got Jesus over to the side. They're having a side conversation. They're looking out for themselves. They could care less what happens to us. They just want to be in a position of authority so that they can rule their authority over uh, over us. So that's exactly what happened. And so what did they do? They're, They're watching out for their backs. They say, wait, 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 wait a second. Let's make this an open conversation. And so people who study corporate culture have arrived at the same conclusion that Jesus did. When James, you know, when James Collins wrote the book, or Jimmy Collins wrote the book, uh, Good to Great, here's what he said. He said, I set out to discover what were the greatest principles for leaders and leadership. He said, I completely thought that what I was going to find is that the top characteristic was going to be charisma. He said, instead, what I found is that the top characteristic was humility. Men and women leading organizations that cared more about the people that they uh, had under them than they cared about themselves. They were constantly working hard to make sure that the people that were under them, whether it be their children or their grandchildren, whether it be uh, as a boss, uh, individuals that worked inside of the corporation, they led with humility. They led with a concern about others. They were more concerned about taking their authority and using it in such a way that they could be a blessing to those that were under their authority, that they could care for those that were under their authority. So let's take a moment and let's talk about how we can apply this this week because I think this is important. If you're a mom or a dad, uh, if you're a spouse, if you're a teacher, or and I know that school just got out, But I want you to think about as you begin to prepare for next year and you get ready to teach. Uh, If you uh, have an individual business that you lead in, if you are here today and you're a corporate leader, if you're here today and you're a boss, and many of us in many, many capacities are bosses uh, every day in life, what are some of the things that we can do this week that Jesus would encourage us to do so that we can lead like Jesus led? Because followers of Jesus become great leaders. And we lead in a different way to impact the world that is around us. So, first of all, I want to talk about the message of leading great. You see, the message of leading great is simply this. It's there in your notes, and you can basically fill in the blank here. It says, I am here to facilitate your success regardless of where you show up on the organizational chart. You see, the idea is this. I'm here as a boss to facilitate your success regardless of where you show up on the organizational chart. I'm here as a teacher to facilitate your success, regardless of where you show up inside of the classroom. I'm here as a parent to facilitate your success, regardless of where you show up on on the chart inside of our home, right? I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm here to facilitate what? To facilitate your growth. It's important to understand that what you're trying to do as a leader is you're trying to facilitate not only the success and the growth of those that you lead. How do you do that? You do it through your influence. The greater the the power you've been entrusted with, the greater the influence you have. And so what do you do? You take that influence and you use it to impact the lives of the people that you lead. 
You use it to influence the lives and to help them succeed at whatever it is that they're called to do. You say, hey, everything I'm going to do is going to help you to succeed. Everything I'm going to do is going to help you to continue to move forward. And after all, we both are essential to the family. We both are essential to the organization. We both are essential to us being able to accomplish what we want to accomplish inside of the organization. And the more power you have, the more facilitating you can do. The more you can make an impact, the more you can make a difference for those that are under your leadership. So what do you do? You take your influence, your power, your de decision making, and you facilitate it for the success of those that are under you, right? That's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus. We are called to facilitate the success of those that God has entrusted to be up under our authority. Now, secondly, I want to talk about the best question of leading. Let me teach you a question that I think you can ask. And mom and dad, this can be with your kids. This can be uh, grandparents with your grandkids. This can be as a boss to those that are under you. This can be as an owner of a company for the people that work for you. But I, I'm not saying I get this right every time, but for every one-on-one -on -one that I have, for every direct report I have, here is the question that I ask over and over and over again. What can I do to help? What can I do to help? And so in every conversation that I have, when somebody sits in front of me, I say, hey, let me ask you a question. What can I do to help? Is there anything that you need that you don't have? Is there anything that I can resource you with that will help you to accomplish your job better? Is there anything that I can do? Now, I don't ever say this, but what I'm basically saying to them is, how can I leverage the authority that I have because you are under my authority to help you succeed? What can I do for you? And throughout the years, there are times that some of my direct reports have looked at me and said, you know, Pastor Marty, to be honest with you, if I could just have this, I think that I would be able to perform at a greater level. And you know what I do? I do everything I can to move heaven and earth, to talk to our board and to our trustees and to say, hey, can we get this into the hands of those that are leading so that we can lead with a greater capacity, so that they can be more successful in what they are doing? You see, there are people on your staff who probably would pass out tomorrow morning if you sat down with them and you looked them in the face and said, hey, what can I do to help? Because you've never asked that question before. What can I do to help? And if you're a leader, I would encourage you in every conversation you have with the people that you are leading, end with, that, end with that question or start with that question. Hey, today as we talk, I just want to ask a question and I want you to be thinking about it before we get to the end. What can I do to help? How can I help? I had a situation happen a couple of weeks ago, and I remember very specifically, I probably did not respond the best. This week as I was studying, I was like, you know what? In that situation, rather than you saying what you said, what you should have done is walked in the room and said, hey, what can I do to help? Is there something that you don't have? Is there something that you guys are missing? Is there something that I can do to help you to be able to accomplish this task and to finish this job? You see, when you ask that question, even with your kids, your spouse may be in the middle of a situation and they're sharing their heart with you and you're talking and, and you may just say to them, hey, what can I do to help? Now, guys, listen to me. Let me be cautious here. When your wife is trying to share her emotions, don't ask the question, what can I do to help? She doesn't want you to do that, okay? Um, because we're fixers, right? And if we're not careful, we'll try to fix it. Sometimes she just wants you to listen and you just need to listen. Just listen, allow her there. And then in those moments, she needs you to affirm her emotions. I can understand how you'd be angry. I can understand why you feel the way you feel. I can understand how you might feel the way that you feel in this moment. But sometimes your spouse needs you to look at them and say, what can I do to help? How can I help in this situation? You know, you know, maybe when you come home in the afternoon and they've had the kids all day, you may say, what can I do to help? You walk through the door and say, what can I do to help? She may pass out and you've got to take care of the kids. But the reality is you're leveraging your authority and your power to say, what can I do to help you succeed? And for your kids, sometimes your kids' parents need you to say, hey, what can I do to help? Mom, I got this situation at school. Dad, I got this situation at school. And man, I got to tell you, it's, it's been hard. It's been difficult. I, I mean, I'm struggling. And you just need to say to them, what can I do to help? Son, how can I leverage my authority as your parent to help you? What can I do to help you? But then listen to this. 
the one application of leading great, the one thing that I want to encourage us to do this week is to look for opportunities to do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. If you've been around North Star very long, you've heard me say this over and over again. Over the years, I've said, we're going to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. You see, the reason we have partners is because we're trying to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. I see tons of churches all over the country oftentimes give $200 or $1,000 or $50 or whatever it is to different organizations. And they'll say, here are the 57 organizations that we support. But here at North Star, what we've done is we've said, we're going to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. And, and we found a few partners and we said, we're just going to leverage our resources and we're going to leverage our time and we're going to leverage our money and we're going to leverage our people and we're going to do everything we can to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. Because guess what? A $100,000 check goes a lot further inside of an organization than a $1,000 check. And 150 people showing up to be the hands and the feet of Jesus go a lot further than five people showing up to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And so this week, I want to encourage you to look around for opportunities to say, I'm going to do for one what I wish I could do for everyone. See, you can't do for everyone inside of the organization, but you can do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And there are times here at North Star that I've just said, hey, I can't do this for everybody, but this is a need in this person's life. And we're going to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. And you'd be amazed at how encouraging it is to everyone else when they say, my goodness, man, look at the generosity and the kindness. We can't do it for everyone. You see, when you were growing up, you probably said something like this. You said, if you, you probably said something like, if you do, I'm sorry, if I do it for you, then I've got to do it for everyone. No, you don't. That's a lie. That's not true. In fact, I used to tell myself that. Well, if I do it for one, I got to do it for everyone. No, no, you don't. If you do it for one, you're saying, hey, I'm going to do for one what I wish I could do for everyone. I can't do this for everybody, but I can do this for this one person. I can make a difference in their life. So leverage your authority for the benefit of those who are under your authority. You see, Jesus wants every one of us as leaders, to be the kind of leader that every time we show up, whether it be at home or in the community or the workplace or on an organizational chart, whatever it may be, he wants us to be the kind of leader that says, I'm going to leverage my authority for the benefit of those that are under my authority. I want you to think about this just for a moment. And we're not going to get political, all right, but I want you to listen to me. What if everybody that led in our government said, I'm going to leverage my authority for those that are under my authority? What would this country be like? And what if every business owner and every CEO of every company began to say, I'm going to leverage my authority for those or, or for the benefit of those that are under my authority? Guys, for 30 years, I've been leading at this church for 20, 26 years, 30 years in ministry. Do you know the one thing that I've learned that I think has been the greatest leadership principle of my life is leveraging my authority for the benefit of those that are under my authority. Every time I make a decision here at North Star, can I tell you something? And I can say this with confidence. I don't ever make a decision that I don't think about every single person sitting in this seat. I don't ever make a decision that I don't say, how is this going to affect our congregation? How is this going to affect the people that attend? What is it going to do to the moms and the dads that are struggling and trying to make a difference in their life? What is it going to do to the marriages of those who attend our church? And I'm constantly trying to leverage the authority that God has entrusted to me for the benefit of those that are under my authority. That's what great leadership does. And that's how Jesus was asking the disciples and that's how Jesus is asking each and every one of us to lead. And so why do you think today we still talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Why do you think we talk about the disciples and so many of the people that were following Jesus? It's because they learned the principle of leveraging their authority for the benefit of those that were under their authority. And it changed everything. So this week, I want to encourage you to go out and lead the way Jesus led. 
That maybe at work, if you've never done this before, that maybe at work you go back this week and you say, you know what, I'm going to start leveraging my authority for the benefit of those that are under my authority. And, and that doesn't mean, listen to me, I want, I want to just say this because I think it's important. It, it's very important. That doesn't mean that you go back and you call everybody into a room and say, hey, I heard a message yesterday and here's what I'm going to start doing. Just start living it. Man, when, when your direct report shows up, just ask them the question that we just talked about a few moments ago. Hey, what can I do to help? How can I help make a difference? You start asking that question and you watch, you watch what begins to happen, not only with your children, but in your family, with your spouse, in your marriage, how it begins to affect uh, your, your leadership at work, uh, the difference that it begins to make, and how all of a sudden everything around you begins to change. Jesus is calling us to leverage our authority for the benefit of those that are under our authority. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that Jesus was the greatest leader in the world. And the only reason 2,000 years later we are still talking about him is because he led in a way that impacted and changed not only lives, but impacted and changed the world. And if we really want to make a difference, if we really want to impact the world around us, then, Father, we will lead in the same way that Jesus led. And so, Lord, I'm going to ask our prayer team if they would to come forward. And as they do, if there's someone here today that maybe has a need in their life, maybe you haven't been leading the way that you know that you should be leading. Maybe in your marriage there's a struggle that's going on. Maybe at work there's a problem that you're facing and you want someone to pray with you. We would love the opportunity to pray with you today. If you're online, you can just text uh, Pastor Delbert, and he would love the opportunity. They would love the opportunity to be able to pray with you today. But, Father, I pray that you would help us to go into the world this week and be the leaders that you've called us to be, that we would lead well in our families, that we would lead well on the ball field, that we would lead well in the classroom, that we would lead well in our businesses, and, God, that we would lead well in the community and even in our church. And may we make a difference because we chose to follow you. And so, Father, we pray that you would go with us now, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen and amen. Hey, listen, I want to encourage you to do something. Next Sunday, if you know someone who is, uh, who is taking a step back from Christianity, uh, maybe someone who said, hey, you know what? I'm thinking about throwing in the towel with my faith. Maybe they've uh, thought about disconnecting from their faith. I want to encourage you to get them here because next Sunday, I'm going to invite you and I'm going to invite them uh, to understand how important it is that we stay engaged with our faith, even when we're doubting some of the things about our faith. So if you know somebody that fits that category, invite them back next Sunday. It's going to be a great Sunday. I love you guys. God bless you. We will see you next Sunday. Have a great day. If you want us to pray for you, we're here to do that this morning.